I know no way of judging the future, but by the past. <laughs> Our topic this afternoon, assuming that I do not croak in the middle of it, is a history of the modern libertarian movement. And it's uh, a bit lighter than some of the things we've been covering. Instructions about what to and not to do to these microphones. <laughs> well, we've all had a long day. Let's not make it any worse than it uh, has to be. Uh, I will go over, I'll warn you that in advance, probably by about 15 minutes. And I've got about three minutes before my mouth dries up completely, so pray for Christina. <laughs> In his talk on classical liberalism, its rise and decline, Ralph Fraco really concluded with the death of several key figures. He mentioned William Graham Sumner, Gustav de Molinari, Herbert Spencer. Uh, we could mention several others, including Lord Acton. Uh, people who had been active throughout the 19th century who died roughly around the time of World War I. Lord Morley, John Morley. <coughs> Uh, whose uh, lacked official act in politics was to resign from the Asquith cabinet over World War I, uh, said that he wanted to be remembered of him, that he never sat for one moment on a war cabinet. He resigned and eventually retired from British life to write his recollections, and he dies about the end of World War I. However, in getting to the modern libertarian movement, there are three individuals I like to treat in about over the next five or six minutes, who I think are quite the key in understanding the growth of the modern libertarian movement. And that's H.L. Mencken, Ludwig von Mises, and Albert J. Nock. Uh, these people are all very interesting, if only because they were active, and perhaps the only intellectuals that active throughout the 1920s and 30s, on a broad range of subject material which was going to lead that is water. Uh, I don't know. We took it out of the fountain. Is that enough, Ron? <laughs> For the first five minutes, huh? Wait till I get my hands on the rest of that book of yours. <laughs> they were active throughout the 1920s and 30s in a way that no one else really was. Uh, these are exciting times. They're lonely times for these individuals, but exciting. And they led to a number of things happening. Uh, a certain element of this talk this evening is going to be pure chronology, combined with sort of some of the fleshing in of some of the writings and work that was being done, some of the personalities here. Uh, some of them you know quite well, some of them you don't. Um, the easiest to start with is H.L. Mencken. Uh, Mencken was born September 12, 1880, which is to say that places him a year older than von Mises, who was born in 1881. Uh, he became a newspaper man early on, and with a, only a, a very good high school education behind him, became one of the deans of American letters. He really became one of the most prominent and preeminent intellectuals of his age. His first book was published in 1905. It was on George Bernard Shaw. A couple of years later, he published the first American book on Friedrich Nietzsche. Throughout the 1910s, he was co-editor with George G. Nathan of the Smart Set magazine, sort of a literary magazine where Mencken started to make his mark. Mencken began really uh, to reach the peak of his influence when in 1924, uh, he uh, and uh, Albert Knopf of Knopf Publishing began publishing the American Mercury magazine. For the first year, it was edited by Mencken and George Dean Nathan. In 1925, Nathan stepped down to the role of contributing editor, and H.L. Mencken remained as the sole editor from then, 1925, until 1933. Uh, Mencken then wrote for The New Yorker, The Baltimore Evening Sun, full time, and uh, had a stroke in 1948, which put him out of commission, and he was dead eight years later at the age of 75 in 1956. I bring up H.L. Mencken because he had vast influence during his lifetime. Uh, 
he really began a career as a journalist in 1899 at the age of 18 and uh, quickly began to see himself as a critic of ideas. Um, the American Mercury was a particularly important magazine this, during this period. Not only did it publish people like Albert J. Knott and certain other uh, quasi-libertarian or classical liberals, it was also a forum for um, World War I revisionism, uh, for crit criticism of, uh, of the foibles of uh, government policy of all sorts. Basically a satirical, scathing magazine. Uh, it nevertheless had uh, a very, very uh, great influence during its time. Uh, in a book on Mencken, George H. Douglas uh, wrote, the book is called H. L. Mencken, published in 1978, that, quote, no magazine of such consistently high standards had been produced before in America. No American magazine had dared to develop a character so completely its own. No magazine produced before in America had been so completely American in its style and outlook. Uh, that just gives you a, a sense of the prestige of the American Mercury. It was really the preeminent monthly magazine of ideas and current issues in American intellectual life, particularly throughout the 1920s. Uh, biting sarcasm really seemed to be uh, the Mencken fort. Uh, he really ripped into uh, all sorts of pretentious ideas, uh, movements, people. Uh, he held no one up uh, uh, as an idol, although according to Douglas, Mencken was heavily influenced during his youth and uh, uh, 20s. Um, by um, the writer William Graham Sumner, the uh, Dean of American Classical Liberals and uh, disciple of Herbert Spencer. i uh, give you a sense of what uh, Mencken used to write. Here is a quote um, about government, a typical sort of target, a typical sort of style. Mencken wrote, quote, the government at Washington is no more impersonal than the cloak and suit business is, is impersonal. It is operated by precisely the same sort of men and to almost the same ends. When we say that it has decided to do this or that, that it proposes or aspires to do this or that, usually to the great cost and inconvenience of nine-tenths of us, we simply say that a definite man or group of men has decided to do it or proposes to do it. And when we examine this group of men realistically, we almost always invariably find that it is composed of individuals who are not only not superior to the general, uh, range of men, but are plainly and uh, depressingly inferior, both in common sense and in common decency. That the acts of government we are called upon to ratify and submit to is, in its essence, no more than an act of self-interest by men who, if there was no mystical authority standing behind them, would have had a hard time of it surviving in the struggle for existence. Uh, Mencken his whole style to his writing was uh, a kind of sarcasm, a withering ridicule. He was a master of the English language, a master of hyperbole, and probably the greatest American essayist in the 19th or 20th centuries. Uh, his, uh, his role in American intellectual life during this period of time was rather commanding. Uh, nevertheless, Mencken really drifted from the scene uh, as soon as the Great Depression hit, and probably because the sort of um, sarcasm and withering ridicule that you could dump on all manner of people, their aspirations and pretensions uh, during the 1920s, an area of prosperity, is really significantly different from what you can get away with in a period of the Great Depression. And when he tried to tear down Roosevelt with the same kind of rhetorical style that he did um, other people in the 1930s, his influence really began to wane. And it's because intellectuals uh, did not see Mencken really as an original thinker proposing any different, any uh, particular ideology or really any particular uh, set of principles. He was more the critic than he was the builder. He was not really an ancestor of any movement, but more an ancestor of a certain style of approaching political issues. Nevertheless, he did publish a great many important individuals in the American Mercury, not the least of whom was Albert J. Nock and really opened up the pages of the American Mercury to a wide-ranging criticism of American ideas. Uh, he was a very colorful personality. Uh, when the, the uh, city of Boston censored the American Mercury for carrying a short essay on prostitution, uh, they banned it in Boston, and Mencken took a copy of the banned issue, several copies, in fact, to sell on a prominent street quarter outside of City Hall. And there, the mayor and chief of police came to buy the American Mercury. <coughs> He took the silver coins from them, and in an inimitable Mencken gesture, he bit the coins, which was a way of telling whether or not they were genuine or counterfeit. 
this sort of gives you the, the sense of what Mencken was all about. He was uh, quite a rabble rouser, quite a, a brilliant intellectual, a brilliant critic, whose influence ultimately was short-lived, uh, if only because he had no program. Two other thinkers dominant. Uh, now, dominant here is a very contextual term. Uh, you see, classical liberalism has died. There's almost no one left. The few people who are left are holding up sort of a candle, a remnant uh, of ideas and trying to build toward a future during which time these ideas may take fruit. Uh, the two other people I'm going to discuss just in passing are Albert J. Nock and Ludwig von Mises. Von Mises, of course, was born in 1881 in Austria. Nock was born in 1870. Uh, the difference between them is that Nock died in 1945 because of World War II, while von Mises lived a long and fruitful life, dying in the early 1970s. Uh, Albert J. Nock had been a, an Episcopalian minister and a writer who in the 1910s, which is to say in his 40s, steeped himself in the classical liberal and Native American radical tradition literature. He studied people like Jefferson, Thoreau, Henry George, Cobden, Bright, and Herbert Spencer. Uh, during, uh, he became a journalist uh, during this period, and during World War I, uh, he was working as an editor for Oscar Garrison Villard's magazine, The Nation. Uh, for that magazine, he wrote a blisteringly radical attack on Wilson's decision to send Samuel Gompers, the uh, conservative anti-radical labor boss, to an international conference of labor and socialist leaders in order to enlist support for Wilson's uh, war plans. Uh, Nock became very well known because the post office confiscated this issue of the nation, the first time this has ever happened in the history of the magazine, and demanded suspension of publication. Uh, after the war, Nock worked with Francis Nielsen, Harry Elmer Barnes, Sidney Fay, Walter Millis, Charles Callan Tansil, and others on World War I revisionism, and he published in the early 1920s his book of World War I revisionism, The Myth of a Guilty Nation. Now, Nock was something of a loner, and it was said that in order to reach Nock when he was not around, one had to uh, leave a note for him under a certain rock in Central Park. No one knew anything about his personal life, no one even knew if he had any. Uh, it was only at the time of his death that people learned that he had some sons and they had been married for a time. So he was an extremely private man who did a great deal of important writing. His most important book is probably published in 1935. It was called Our Enemy the State. And to give you a sense of Nock's thought, um, uh, Nock wrote about history as being a race between state power and social power. Nock built on the thesis of Franz Oppenheimer, who in turn was building on early, earlier German and French writers, uh, the thesis that there were two and only two means of gaining wealth in human society, the economic means and the political means. The economic means were seen as being the production and exchange of wealth, the political means the expropriation of the wealth of others. The state, Nock, like Oppenheimer before him, uh, saw as really the organization of the political means. Uh, he saw the goal of American collectivists as being quote, the complete extinction of social power through its absorption by the state. Uh, Nock became more and more important throughout the 1920s, widely published in things like the Atlantic Monthly and the American Mercury, the equivalent, you know, of things like Commentary and Harper's and Atlantic Monthly today. And uh, he uh, had a great deal uh, more to say than Mencken in the sense that he was closer to being a systematizer, closer to being a serious intellectual rather than uh, a fun-loving, uh, gregarious, extroverted personality of the stripe that Mencken was, really. And uh, he really laid uh, quite a foundation for much of libertarian thought later on. Uh, he wrote um, in Army of the State, and it should be noted that uh, this book was originally given as a series of uh, advanced history lectures at Columbia University in the early 1930s. He wrote, quote, it is interesting to observe that in the year 1935, the average individual's incurious attitude toward the phenomena of the state is precisely what his attitude was toward the phenomenon of the church in the years, say, of 1500. The state was a very weak institution. The church was very strong. The individual was born into the church as his ancestors had been for generations in precisely the formal documented fashion in which he is now born into the state. He was taxed for the church's support as he now is for the state's support. He was supposed to accept the official theory and doctrine of the church, to conform to its discipline, and in general, in a general way, to do as it told him. Again, precisely the sanctions that the state now lays upon him. If he were reluctant or recalcitrant, the church made a satisfactory amount of trouble for him, 
as the state now does. Notwithstanding all this, it does not appear to have occurred to the church citizen of that day any more than it occurs to the state citizen of the present to ask what sort of institution it was that claimed his allegiance. Uh, Nock uh, was a libertarian who was influenced by Henry George, the position uh, of basically a sound radical libertarianism combined with an unfortunate view of the impropriety of individuals owning property and land. He was a single taxer, in short, and he ate, later influenced um, Frank Chodorov, a prominent post-World War II uh, libertarian who in turn influenced people like Murray Rothbard, um, Leonard Leggio, Ralph Franco, and others. To give you a sense of what it was like during the 1930s in America for an intellectual knock stripe, uh, to give you a sense of the barrenness that he faced, I'll read you one more quote from page 23 of Our Enemy of the State. Quote, it seems the most discreditable thing that this century has not seen produced in America an intellectually respectable presentation of the complete case against the state's progressive confiscations of, state po of social power, a presentation, that is, which bears the mark of having sound history and a sound philosophy behind it. Mere interested touting of rugged individualism and agonized fustian fustian about the Constitution are so specious, so frankly unscrupulous, that they have become contemptible. Consequently, collectivism has easily had the best of it intellectually, and the results are now apparent. Uh, that's important for me to quote because it gives you a sense of the frustration that an intellectual of Knox caliber had in the intellectual desert of the 1920s and the 1930s. Mises I will treat here in passing because uh, he is working mostly in Austria. Therefore, he's not influencing the American uh, libertarian movement at this point in his career. But this just gives you a sense of chronology of where these things fit in, is that uh, uh, Mises had served in the Austrian army in World War I, and later began his famous private seminar, uh, the private seminar in Austria, in Vienna, which was uh, sort of unofficial, unaccredited, but attended by everyone from Fritz Machlop, Oscar Morgenstern, to um, F.A. Hayek. Uh, this seminar took place throughout the 1920s, and it was really the first of two major seminars, the other beginning in the late 1940s in the United States. But all in German, Mises began to publish a whole slew of very important works. Uh, Socialism appeared in the early 1920s, his book Liberalism, Critique of Interventionism, and Nation, State, and Economy. I'm giving all the American titles of books published first in German in the 1920s. Uh, something else happens, that's just to give you a, just sort of an overview very quickly of what intellectual life was like in the 20s and the very early 1930s, which is to say there are no prominent intellectuals, at least not in America, and only slightly so in Europe, uh, who are really holding up the banner of the old-fashioned classical liberal ideals. Uh, Mises becomes, in effect, the first of their return. Uh, Nock is another who is the first of their return, far less ambitious than Mises, far less scholarly, uh, a better writer perhaps, but, uh, but nowhere in, in near Mises' rank as a thinker. Although I would say that uh, Our Enemy of the State is well worth reading. Now, starting with our chronology to give sort of a running leap, a uh, look at the history of the modern movement, we can go through the 20s very quickly. What of significance happened during the 1920s? There was the Mises Seminar in Austria, Mises publication of books in German, in the German language. The beginning of work by Friedrich Hayek, who was working as Mises' assistant, doing business cycle research. His first book is published in German in 1928, Monetary Theory in the Trade Cycle. Uh, something else happens in the 1920s, which is going to bear fruit a few years later, and that's that Ayn Rand, a uh, uh, Russian Jewish girl, grew up in the, uh, in the Soviet heartland of middle-class Jewish parents, lived through the Russian Revolution, uh, decided when she was a young girl to escape, and did so <coughs> in the mid-1920s. By 1929, she has married Frank O'Connor in Mexico and returns to this country as an American citizen, being the wife of, of an American citizen. 1930s, we have uh, all sorts of exciting things beginning to take place. I'm just going to give you a sense of the bubbling up of this because the real modern movement begins in the 1940s and 50s. And there's a whole slew of in intellectuals, institutions, books, ideas that come together in a way which is sort of fascinating, but very quick, very quick. Um, so in the 1920s, Rand escapes from Russia. In the 1930s, uh, we began to see some very technical works uh, and some very obscure works, which only later, much later, get recognition. We get some more work by Friedrich Hayek, such as his book, Prices and Production, 
based on his lectures at the London School of Economics in the early 1930s. Uh, a later book by him consisting of essays written throughout the 30s to elaborate on various themes, profits, interest, and investment. Ayn Rand publishes her first novel to virtually no acclaim, We the Living, a novel set in Soviet Russia, which she has republished many, many years later in 1958 in an edited and significantly changed version. Um, 1935, Albert J. Knox, Our Enemy of the State. In 1936, Rosewater Lane publishes in the Saturday Evening Post an essay, Give Me Liberty, which is later reprinted as a pamphlet. Now, something interesting begins to happen uh, in the 1930s, which is that a whole slew of people begun coming together out of opposition to New Deal policies, both in foreign and domestic. Uh, around 1934, 35, and 36, a whole group of people, William Mullendore, an industrialist, Leonard Reed, who had worked for the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, and was just sort of an ordinary uh, person in terms of his ideology. He worked closely with the NRA and other New Deal groups. Uh, Albert J. Nock, Mencken, Rosewater Lane, Isabel Patterson, John T. Flynn, uh, v. W. Uh, uh, Orville Watts uh, comes into play here. Um, the work of Mises is gradually translated into English. Uh, some of the work of Friedrich Hayek becomes available and starts spreading. Um, the elder R.C. Hoyles, publisher of the Freedom newspaper chain, R.C. Hoyles as he's known, uh, particularly his flagship, the Santa Ana Register, uh, begins publishing more or less libertarian editorials in opposition to the New Deal. Um, a great many other people around the country began to sort of find their ideas coalescing. They find themselves increasingly frustrated with the New Deal, welfare, warfare state, and they began to come together and exchange ideas and interact. Uh, you see Leonard Reed getting together with um, uh, Mullendore, who converted him to libertarianism, what we would now call libertarianism. He's meeting Rosewater Lane. Uh, a couple years later, he meets Ayn Rand. Uh, he meets Henry Hazlitt. It's Henry Hazlitt's wife, Frances Hazlitt, who introduced uh, Rand to the people who got her job at Paramount, writing movie scripts for half a year while she worked on uh, another novel, uh, part of the rest of the year. Uh, so, bubbling up of ideas. Um, the late 1930s began to see the publication of, a, of several different small presses. The Register Press, Pamphleteers Incorporated, which was Leonard Reed's uh, organization. They uh, printed some things by Frederick Bastiat, such as law, The Law. They published a version of Rosebottle Lane's Give Me Liberty in booklet form. Uh, they published an early Hazlitt booklet. Uh, they published a version of uh, Andrew Dixon White's Fiat Money Inflation in France. These are all the late 30s, early 40s. There's also the American First Committee and a great amount of intellectual energy and effort on a great, great many people's part, really from Mencken and Nock to John T. Flynn fighting American intervention or entry into World War II. Uh, up until uh, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, they were fairly successful, and as it has been mentioned, about 80% of the American people opposed entry into the Second World War until that uh, provoked attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, so, uh, these things are starting to come together. Now, you might expect, interestingly, there to be a, a remarkable lack of work, of output, of intellectual energy during these years sort of in exile. Uh, these opponents of American empire, opponents of American foreign policy have lost, after all. We're engaged in the most destructive war of the 20th century, or indeed any other century has ever seen. But what you find, interestingly enough, is that the 1930s, the 1940s, rather, become a remarkably uh, productive period in American intellectual history. There's the coming together of a vast amount of work, both by people who are natively American and by people who are, who are emigres from Russia or Nazi Germany. Uh, this includes Ayn Rand and Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. Uh, to give you a sense, let me give you a chronology Oh, that goes, let's say, from 1941 to 1949. There's an eight-year period. Crucially important and very, very interesting. In 1941, you have a, a huge book published, National Economy, the German language edition by Ludwig von Mises that later was revised into Human Action, which was published in 1949. So you can bracket the years with the first German edition and the English edition of Human Action, National Economy in 1941, Human Action in 49. 
1943 and 44, there's an incredible outburst by these people. They've met, they've begun talking, they've been, begun talking about organizing, about getting things published and printed. There's a whole slew of things published. Let me give you a quick list. Uh, between 1943 and 44, we have Albert J. Knox's send-off, Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, a beautifully written work which reflects on really the autobiography of the ideas which he has held throughout his lifetime. He's nearing death. He dies in 1945, not before he has helped kick off what he himself called the remnant, a group of individuals in constant contact with each other who are going to hide alive, to keep alive the flame of the ideas of individual liberty. You have The God of the Machine published by Isabel Patterson, sometime novelist and book critic for the New York Herald American. A uh, very powerful book by, and interestingly, three of these books published in this period are by women. Ayn Rand, Isabel Patterson, and Rose Wilder Lane. Very powerful intellectual women, but quite an influence. It's a very, very interesting development, if you look at it from the standpoint of several things. One, feminism, that three women were very prominent. It was three women uh, who uh, John Chamberlain gives credit to in his, uh, his memoirs, A Life with a Printed Word, these three women, for converting him away from his old socialist faith to a belief in individualism and libertarianism, three women. If there's another pattern, it's that the majority of them are Jewish. Jewish intellectuals who are expatriates from Austria, Germany, uh, and uh, Russia. Uh, it's almost as though the libertarian movement, in its most intellectual phase, were kicked off by a group of Jewish intellectuals who had been frustrated and seen through the myths of both fascism and communism. They didn't hold truck with either Stalinism or Trotskyism of the sort that American Jewish intellectuals were busily quabbling over. Uh, they didn't go for either one of those. So we have other books being published, such as The Discovery of Freedom by Rose Wilder Lane, written, as she puts it, in a white heat, a glowing testimony, uh, which begins with the sentence that I read to you at the opening of My Ethics of Liberty, here we are on a planet twirling in sunlit space and ends with the words, win this revolution, of course we will. We are Americans. We shall spread these ideas throughout the whole world. Um, we have The Fountainhead being published, a novel by Ayn Rand. Omnipotent Government by Ludwig von Mises. A two-year period now. I'm just giving you a list for a two-year period. Omnipotent Government by Ludwig von Mises, subtitled The Rise of the Total State and Total War. As We Go Marching by John T. Flynn. We'll return to that in a moment. It's published by Doubleday, a big publisher, in 1944. Flynn had been born in 1882. He went to Georgetown University Law School and then took up journalism. He was a columnist and a contributor with the New Republic throughout the 1930s. And he was the chairman of the American First Committee in New York, a well-known radio commentator. Uh, during the last half of 1940, uh, the New Republic editor, Bruce B B Belivlin, dismissed Flynn as a columnist. And he began to become in contact with the rest of these people. Uh, he's kept off the air uh, from his uh, weekly radio speeches that he made at attacking the Roosevelt policy as leading us toward war. So he went ahead and penned a book, As We Go Marching, which is really about the rise of national socialism. It's Italian variant, it's, it's German variant, and it's American variant, which is how he saw the New Deal as an American version of national socialism transplanted into the American culture as we go marching. We have The Road to Serfdom by Friedrich Hayek. 1944, published in a condensed version in Reader's Digest. Uh, this book by an emigre uh, Austrian intellectual living in England is published by University of Chicago Press, and its first printing sells out within a matter of days after the Reader's Digest article hits the streets. It goes back into press again and again and again, and finally hundreds of thousands are sold over a 25-year period. We have, in the, the same period, the Register Publishing Company publishing uh, Bastia's Economic Sophisms and Economic Harmonies, the translation uh, which was done at the end of the 19th century. It had a foreword by Rose Wilder Lane. Um, fascinating stuff. So there, those are just some of the books published during a two-year period, some of my favorites. In 1945, we have the republication of some more of Bastiat's writings, including The Law. We have, in 1946, two very key developments. We have a key book, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. And we have Leonard Reed achieving his dream, which he's held now for about 10 years, of starting an institute devoted solely to the, the teaching of the doctrines of liberty. He calls it the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE for short. And it's located on a, in a state north of New York City in Irvington-Hudson, New York. A uh, very, very interesting period here. 
1947, Caxton Printers publishes an updated version with an introduction uh, by someone whose name I haven't written down, of William Graham Summers, What Social Classes Owe to Each Other. Uh, we have Mencken in 1948, just shortly before his stroke, completing the editing of his own collection of his favorite workings called A, Mes a Mencken Crestomathy. Uh, it's a Mencken bed book. It's the thing you want to take, you know, to read snippets of before you're going to go to sleep. It's uh, riotously funny. You have the Mises Seminar in its second incarnation, beginning at New York University. It's here that thinkers like Murray Rothbard, Leonard Leggio, Percy Graves, Bettina Bien, um, you know, just a whole slew of people, Israel Kersner, learning at the feet of a master, at Mises in his prime. Mises left uh, Austria about the time the Germans came in. He worked in Switzerland for a few years and then came to the United States in the mid-1940s, settling down with the help of Henry Hazlitt. Uh, he got a post teaching at the business school of New York University. Uh, remember that Mises at this point is an old man. He's about 70 years old, starting a whole second career. Interestingly enough, he was never paid anything by NYU. He was paid money from private business contributions throughout all those years, about the next 20 years that he continued to teach at NYU. This great man who had a, quite a reputation in Europe in the 20s and 30s of being the, the dean of liberal economists and liberal social thinkers was not offered a university position in the United States of America. Compare that with other refugees like Herbert Marcuse and see how they were treated in the United States. So this is a key period in here. And a lot of exciting things have begun to happen. The Foundation for Economic Education began to publish pamphlets. It published an attack on rent control by two young economists. Uh, they happened to be named Milton Friedman and George Stigler. In 1946, uh, this in turn came to the attention of Murray Rothbard and a group of other people in New York who were alerted to the existence of Mises, who they had only heard about through histories of economic thought classes about the calculation debate. They thought he was dead. They had no idea that he was a man in his 70s about to start another seminar. Um, you have Fee beginning to teach the equivalent of uh, high school versions of the Cato Seminar, Courses in Liberty by people like Hans Sinholtz later. Bettina Bien, Percy Graves, Edmund Opitz, uh, Baldy Harper was one of the early associates. Uh, Herbert and Dick Cornell uh, were early associates of the foundation. Paul Perot, who took over the magazine The Freeman after it floundered. They, they attempted to begin The Freeman again. You have during this period the beginnings of not just an attempt to revise the old Freeman, which Albert A. Nock had edited in the 1920s. Uh, that failed and became converted into the digest size uh, Freeman that you all know about from the Foundation for Economic Education in the early 50s. You have the starting of uh, Frank Chodorov's uh, attempted newspaper, Analysis, survived for a few years with uh, Chodorov doing most of the writing for it, most of the writing himself from his New York apartment and uh, office. Uh, you have the beginning of human events right after World War II, which in its initial incarnation is founded by Felix Morley, uh, by, um, let's see, Morley was involved, Frank Chodorov and Hannigan, Frank Hannigan, uh, was one of the co-authors of a book published in the mid-1930s called Merchants of Death. It's interesting to think, see that this is what the right wing is at this point in time. Uh, this is where the right wing comes from. It comes from sort of anti-war, anti-centralized uh, government sentiments. In the early 1950s, you have things published like Vivian Callum's Toil, Taxes, and Trouble the ancestor of the current tax revolt. You have Garrett Garrett bringing together three essays published in 1944, 1951, and 1952 called The Revolution Was, Ex America, and The Rise of Empire. He publishes this as a book called The People's Pottage. In 1953, Harry Elmer Barnes edits a collection drawn from all of the, um, the uh, anti-World War II books that were published during this period, a book called Perpetual War for Perpetual Peace a uh, phrase he has taken out of Orwell. Um, other things that just could be mentioned in passing. Um, you have uh, new English editions of Mises' Socialism. Mises publishes Theory and History. You have a number of works of Frank Chodorov published. He had published a number of pamphlets such as Taxation is Robbery during and after World War II. Uh, he published The Case for Isolationism, a lot of little pamphlets that are collected into books during the early 50s. 
Uh, we have some Hayek books begin to bubble from the press, like Individualism and Economic Order, A Counter-Revolution of Science, and Pure Theory of Capital. Pure Theory of Capital comes out in the early 40s. Uh, we have the first American translation of Menger's Principles of Economics. Uh, in 1959, we have Bumbarek's Capital and Interest, the three-volume set translated for the first time. So what I'm trying to get across to you is that in the late 40s and early 1950s, we have come together several different strands of thought, Native American isolationism and radicalism, uh, American individualism. We have sort of the Mencken-esque uh, debunking of uh, political leaders and uh, would-be intellectuals. Uh, we have Rand beginning to write novels. Uh, we have Is Isabel Patterson and Rosewater Lane, who are already very well known as novelists, beginning to write nonfiction works, which helped build a libertarian worldview. We have a lot of these people working with each other and with others to revive the works of people like William Graham Sumner. Herbert Spencer's Man vs. the State is republished by Caxton during this period of time with an introduction by Albert J. Nock. Um, a whole slew of things beginning to come together. And there's one organization really that uh, begins to really capture the whole flavor of the thing in the early 50s, and that's the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, Fee is really the cradle of liberty here. As Leonard reads creation, this is where everyone came together to teach and to learn uh, from the great masters, uh, from people like uh, Henry Hazlitt and Ludwig von Mises and Leonard Reed himself. Uh, Reed was never much of an intellectual in the sense that we mean the term today. He was not a scholar, certainly. Uh, but he was a businessman who took a very important lead in organizing and setting into motion the regular publication of things concerned with uh, the burning ideals of individual liberty. Uh, it's a very exciting time during this whole period. We have, uh, as I say, the Freeman and human events being started up. And several things happen which sort of show you where things are going to go wrong. Uh, because uh, uh, things decline a little bit throughout the 1950s and then rise again in the 1960s. What happened was a struggle for power in the American right. A good many of the people that I've been talking to you about uh, for the first half hour or so of this talk were considered initially to be part of the old right, the old conservative movement in America that really came into existence to oppose the New Deal programs of the 30s and 40s. They were both anti-welfare state and anti-warfare state. They were against the suppression of civil liberties. Uh, they were against uh, all of the Roosevelt policies up and down the line. And to give you a, the flavor of a couple of things they said, um, you know, their, their major political leader during this time was Robert Taft, who was a bit too pink for most of them, but it was he that they looked up to. And here is a quote from uh, Congressman uh, Buffett, who was to be Taft's Midwestern campaign manager in 1952. Here he's talking about American foreign policy. I just want to give you the flavor here to show that not only were these people laissez-faire radicals, but they were continuing the classical liberal heritage of being anti-war, being anti-militarism, anti-government spending on military projects and armaments. Buffett in 1952 declared, even if it were desirable, America is not strong enough to police the world by force. If that attempt is made, the blessings of liberty will be replaced by coercion and tyranny at home. Our Christian ideals cannot be exported to other lands by dollars and guns. Our uh, persuasion and example are the methods taught by the carpenter of Nazareth, and if we believe in Christianity, we should try to advance our ideals by his methods. We cannot practice might and force abroad and retain freedom at home. We cannot talk world cooperation and practice power politics. <coughs> Here is Chodorov writing during the McCarthy era. I'm reading these two to give you a sense of why things are going to split in the mid-1950s, why everything is going to go two very radical and very interesting separate ways. During the height of the McCarthy hysteria, Chorov writes, and now we come to the spy hunt, which is in reality a heresy trial. What is it that perturbs the inquisitors? They do not ask the, sus the suspects, do you believe in power? Do you adhere, adhere to the idea that the individual exists for the glory of the state? Are you against taxes, or would you raise them until they absorb the entire output of this country? Are you opposed to the principle of conscription? Do you favor more social gains under the aegis of an enlarged bureaucracy? Such questions, he wrote, might prove embarrassing to the investigators. The answers might bring out a similarity between their ideas and purposes and those of the suspected. They too worship power. Under the circumstances, they limit themselves to the one question, are you a member of the Communist Party? And this turns out to mean 
have you aligned yourselves with the Moscow branch of the church? <laughs> Here's a quote from Lewis Bromfield. I quoted something else from him earlier today. Our warmongers and the military apparently believe that all other nations are unimportant and can be trampled underfoot the moment either Russia or the U.S. sees fit to precipitate a war. To this faction, the warmongers and the military, it seems of small concern that the nations lying between us and Russia would be the most terrible sufferers. The growing neutralism of the European nations is merely a reasonable, sensible, and civilized reaction, legitimate in every respect, when all the factors from Russia's inherent weaknesses to our own meddling and aggressiveness are taken into consideration. The Korean situation will not be settled until we withdraw entirely from an area in which we have no right to be and leave the peoples of that area to work out their own problems. Now, quotations like that give the sense of an era which is really uh, very far removed from uh, anything you know, that we know from the right wing in this country. Well, what happened in the, is that in the middle 1950s, um, a young Turk comes up with some inherited money, some ideas. Uh, he had written a book from uh, his uh, situation as an undergraduate at Yale University called God and Man at Yale. He's recruited into the CIA by Wilmore Kendall, works for the CIA for a year or two. He then comes together with a group of conservative Catholics, anti-communist Catholics, and ex-communists, people like James Burnham, Wilmore uh, Kendall, um, people like uh, Whitaker Chambers, and began a magazine called the National Review. Uh, the money in the family, of the Buckley family, of course, William F. Buckley Jr. is the gentleman of whom I speak, comes from oil. It's a well-established, well-connected New England family based in Connecticut. And Buckley began uh, really the modern conservative movement's charge away from the anti-war views of the old right to the pro-Cold War momentum of the new right. Today, when we hear of the new right, we, you know, the right of Richard Vigory and all those people, it's as though the Buckley right had been there from time immemorial. But indeed, it had not. It only came on the scenes in the middle to late 1940s. In fact, an interesting thing is that uh, sort of symbolic of this going of the separate ways of the new Buckley right from the old conservative right and the dying off of the old conservative right, the, the uh, anti-war right, if you would, um, is really the issue of militarism. It's really the issue of militarism because Buckley became convinced, as did Burnham and others. James Burnham had been the, probably the most prominent Trotskyist intellectual in the United States before his, his defection to the ranks of conservatism. He wrote books like The Managerial Revolution, and the Machiavellians, which was a positive, not a negative book, incidentally, on the Machiavellians. Well, John T. Flynn was in the middle of this, and he's sort of symbolic, because uh, in uh, one of his writings as a result of World War II, he said that America had, quote, managed to acquire bases all over the world. There was no part of the world where trouble can break out, where we do not have bases of some sort in which we cannot claim our interests are menaced. Thus menaced, there must remain, when the war is over, a continuing argument in the hands of the imperialists for a vast naval establishment and a huge army to attack anywhere or anyone or to resist an attack from all the enemies we shall be obliged to have. We must have enemies. They will become an economic necessity for us. This is John T. Flynn. I bring him up at this point because Flynn's continual free market anti-war writings lead to a collision between this grand old man of American isolationism and National Review. On October 22nd, 1956, William Buckley rejected an article by John T. Flynn submitted to the National Review on American militarism. Flynn, he said, did not understand the nature of the Soviet threat. Fifteen years earlier, of course, the New Republic had said the same thing of Flynn invoking the Nazi threat. We have a mirror image here of uh, Flynn and uh, Buckley versus Flynn and the New Republic. Uh, Flynn died a few years later, of course, but in the interim, several important things happened. The Freeman, Freeman had been shrunk down to a digest size magazine, which no longer addressed current affairs. It was now published by a tax-exempt organization. It, didn't, it lost its former militant tone, uh, its uh, anti-New Deal tone, its anti-welfare-warfare state tone. It became sort of the 
freedom-loving pussycat that it is today. I don't mean to put the Freeman down. It has got a lot of good material in it. Uh, but it, uh, it doesn't engage current issues the way uh, that it did in the early 50s and late 40s. Uh, we find human events undergoing a transfer of ownership and becoming itself converted into the Cold War camp. Uh, we have Chodorov having a stroke in the late 50s and being silenced. Uh, we have Murray Rothbard's break with National Review in 1958 over the proper attitude to take toward the, uh, uh, the Khrushchev visit to the United States to meet with Eisenhower in the first of many summits. We have really a parting of the ways here um, between two great camps, uh, the individualist libertarian anti-war right, which becomes the libertarian movement of today, and the conservative movement led by William F. Buckley Jr., which became the conservative movement we know today. Now, I've skimmed over some of the events from 19, uh, 1957 in order to be able to return to them and to some of the chronology because the 1950s and 60s were a very interesting time. Uh, aside from the works of uh, Mises and Hayek, really, you'd have to say that the intellectual defenses of capitalism that exist in the United States throughout this period were not on altogether a high intellectual plane. Uh, these people were intellectuals, but they held that the proper strategy was more or less to address oneself to the common man. And so a great many of their works, particularly Chodorov's, I would say, are written down with a, a, a potential mass audience in mind, but of sort of lowbrow readers. They did nothing to really build an intellectual movement. Uh, Mises and Hayek are, of course, quietly teaching and publishing. Hayek at this point is at the University of Chicago, beginning to have a handful of students uh, after he left London School of Economics. Mises has his small seminar at NYU, uh, where Leggio and Reiko and Rothbard and Kersner and others are busy attending and listening. Uh, outside of that, there really uh, <coughs> is no great weight behind the movement for free market ideals up until this point. But in 1957, that changed, and something in interesting came on the scenes. Uh, I've described it elsewhere as though the heavens were torn open and Zeus had thrown down a, a bolt of lightning. It was, of course, the 1957 publication, on September 30th, of Ayn Rand's book, Atlas Shrugged. Um, there's a sense in which nothing more needs to be said after that about Ayn Rand, but there's another sense in which a great deal needs to be said. Because this book really was a remarkable challenge to the status quo. It was published during the age of what Daniel Bell had later named the end of ideology <coughs> during the Eisenhower administration, one of the most conservative, and cautious, unspectacular administrations that we've ever seen in terms of its, uh, its policies. There was nothing radical about it, revolutionary. It didn't repeal very much, and it didn't go forward very much. It just sort of sat there dead in the water. And then Ayn Rand launched this novel on which she had been working for so many years. And nothing was really ever the same. The first printing from Random House in 1957 was more than 100,000 copies. They went back to the press again and again and again. Today, there are about 7 million copies in print. Uh, she published several other books, of course. In 1958, Nathaniel Brandon Lectures was born with her so-called then intellectual heir, Nathaniel Brandon and his uh, cohorts and associates, including his wife, Barbara Brandon, giving a 20-lecture course on the basic principles of objectivism in many cities. Um, this begins to build gradually, so that in the early 1960s, they have lectures in about 30 or 40 cities, amounting to 2,500 students. Uh, a little bit later, they'll have uh, lectures in 83 cities at their peak, and will reach uh, many, many more thousands. NBI built up a mailing list of more than 60,000 and this is important to note because uh, NBI did more than just teach Rand's philosophy. They published a book catalog, which I think is just as responsible as anything else for the bringing to prominence of Mises and Hayek and people like them. It was their book list, which included a good many of the people that I've been talking about, particularly Bastia and Mises and Hazlitt, uh, to this, this mass audience compared to what they had been able to achieve beforehand. Um, Mises' human action starts to go through many different printings after this is published. The NBI, I've talked to the people who ran it, sell simply thousands upon thousands of copies of this, this very dense economic treatise uh, in the 1960s. I won't get too much into the influence of Rand, uh, 
I think there'll probably be some talk about this in the discussion group tonight. Obviously a very fascinating and mesmerizing woman, uh, just a fascinating figure on, on the American scene with her clipped Russian accent, her short stocky build, uh, her big round uh, dark eyes, her pupils and iris almost merging in this sort of black hole at the center of each eye, uh, her looking as though she were borrowing into you when she looked at you. Uh, 1962, she started a newsletter with Nathaniel Brandon, The Objectivist Newsletter, later converted into a magazine called The Objectivist. At its peak, it reached a circulation of 22,500, which is quite a number of people, considering what other people have been able to achieve with other magazines. Um, we have the William Volcker Foundation, um, active in the 1960s, publishing books. We have the University of Chicago coming out well, with some of its graduate students, such as Ronald Hamway, Sam Peltzman, and Editor-in-Chief Ralph, Ra Ralph Rako, publishing the New, New Individualist Review. In 1962, we have Murray Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State being published in Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. Uh, 1960s, we have a whole host of books coming from the objectivists. We have For the New Intellectual, Who is Ayn Rand, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and other things. We have the small journal Left and Right, started by Ligio, H. George Resch, and Murray Rothbard in uh, 1964. Uh, we have um, all sorts of different organizations begun and falling. We have the rise and fall of the Freedom School, started in 1957 by Robert Lefebvre, the founder of what he called autarky or self-rule. Um, he was an individualist libertarian who had been an editorial writer for one of the R.C. Hoyle's newspapers, the Colorado Springs Gazette Telegraph. And uh, Lefay began to teach courses, secluded away in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, a square mile of territory, speckled with log cabins where people would come for two-week periods to learn and to teach. Uh, Reed in many, uh, Lefebvre in many ways is as responsible as anyone except Rand and read for the growing movement because there's a period of a couple of years there when they held a secluded retreat uh, called the Frontistery and they had their teachers such as Mises, Hayek, Friedman, Rosewater Lane, Frank Chodorov, uh, just a whole slew of people teaching there for a year or two. And graduate students were people like R.J. Smith and, uh, and uh, Hamaway and an awful lot of others who went on to become fairly prominent uh, libertarian intellectuals of their uh, generation. A uh, very prominent thing. So throughout the 1960s, uh, probably the, uh, uh, the two main forces in terms of giving intellectual weight uh, to liberty, uh, maybe three if I widen it a little bit, would be Ayn Rand, uh, Friedrich Hayek, and Milton Friedman. Uh, Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom is just a very nicely done, forceful uh, book about the case for capitalism and its interrelation between capitalism and freedom. Uh, in 1960, we have The Constitution of Liberty published by Friedrich Hayek, his attempt to restate the principles of classical liberalism for a new generation. And of course we have Ayn Rand simply everywhere. Those books sold like hotcakes and she was off on one campus after another. She refused to fly and so piled into cars and into trains, she and her entourage, her, her group of followers who were so close that uh, often they were interrelated and intermarried. Uh, <laughs> Followed her everywhere. She lectured on, you know, just dozens of college campuses on things like the objectivist ethics, uh, faith and force, the destroyers of the modern world, the fascist new frontier, where she compared the Kennedy program with that of, uh, that of the Nazi party platform from the 20s, uh, the new fascism ruled by consensus, her withering critique of Lyndon Johnson, the wreckage of the consensus. Uh, the list goes on and on. And every year she began to give these on Ford Hall forum series. Uh, and they're broadcast on public radio along with a question and answer period that lasts for two hours with thousands upon thousands of followers listening to her across the country. To give you a sense of the dimensions of the influence of this woman, that she could pack a house on any college campus in a moment's notice. She was like Vladimir Horowitz is today in the world of music. People would stand in line for days to get tickets if necessary. And she blasted liberalism and conservatism alike. She saw herself, interestingly enough, as talking to the open-minded liberal. As for conservatism, what she had to say was contained in her essay, Conservatism, an Obituary, which she wrote in the early 19, 1960s. Uh, she was withering, and she just did not pull her punches for anyone. She was uh, saying things to the effect that she ch challenged the cultural traditions of two and a half thousand years. Uh, she wanted to take philosophy back to Aristotle and fiction back to Victor Hugo, and music back to the great age of 
uh, Lehar and Strauss and Kalman and Rachmaninoff, the light oper operettas of Vienna that she heard in the, in the movie theaters of uh, Soviet Russia, and the music of Rachmaninoff, which remained among her favorites until uh, the day she died um, in 1982. Uh, to say that her influence was profound is to understate the case. One magazine after another devoted multi-page stories about her life, uh, Time, magazine Newsweek, uh, magazines like uh, Commonweal devoted to attacks on her, attempted refutations of her uh, by one person after another. But her influence just began to spread to give you a sense of how great this is and how much other figures like Rothbard and Mises and Hayek really came in with her, behind her, her cloak, her cape, so to speak. Uh, she was fond of wearing a cape and sort of a Napoleonic uh, uh, triangular hat. Um, she smoked cigarettes with a, a long uh, cigarette holder and, and, a, and a solid gold brooch shaped in the sign of a dollar. A dollar sign which at the end of Atlas Shrugged she says is a symbol of uh, uh, free, uh, free mind and uh, free markets and therefore a free mind, a free man, something like that. Um, uh, she just had enormous influence. Uh, as of today, her books continue to sell, incidentally. Atlas Shrugged continues to sell in paperback at the rate of 125,000 copies a year. Uh, the Fountainhead still sells about 90,000 copies a year. There are about 18 million copies of her books available in the English language. She's been translated into at least a dozen others that I've been able to trace. <coughs> as great as the influence of Mises and Hayek, and Friedman then, it's Ayn Rand more than anyone else that reaches a huge mass audience with intellectual books, with intellectual books. Uh, when The Virtue of Selfishness is first published in paperback, she sells several hundred thousand copies in the first few months, so much so that the publisher does something unprecedented. It had started by publishing it in paperback, but the demand was so great, it went into hardcover. And the hardcover then became a bestseller, even though the paperback was still was available. Just to give you a sense of the impact of this powerful, powerful woman, uh, who I consider to be really the first Russian Jewish dissident. Uh, <laughs> she really is. She left Russia in the, in the mid to late 1920s, and, and uh, one of the reasons she never had any influence with American intellectuals is they were so heavily influenced by their own Jewish forebearers who were first generation emigrants or the offspring of first generation emigrants from Eastern Europe, which is to say during this period of time, we're talking about authoritarian sort of right wing Eastern European regimes. They are all youngish Jews who look up uh, to the world with socialist illusions, socialist ideals. Ayn Rand would never have any of this and dismissed it from the outset. She dismissed it from the outset and she said that Stalin did not corrupt, corrupt any noble ideals, that it's socialism itself which was morally evil and corrupt. She said this again and again throughout her lifetime. She said it in We the Living, she said it in Atlas Shrugged, and she said it in every nonfiction piece that she wrote after that. In 1968, several things start to happen at once and we get the beginning of the modern, modern libertarian movement. That is not the objectivist movement, not the old right, you know, the anti-war, America first right, uh, not the anti-war, pre-Buckley conservative right, uh, not young people from Mises seminars, but the first libertarian movement. Uh, this begins really in 1968 with the Rand-Brandon split. For reasons I cannot divulge before a camera and microphones, <clears throat> there was a bitter breakup between Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon in 1968. Rand denounced Brandon in a, in a withering essay called To Whom It May Concern in her magazine, The Objectivist. Nathaniel Brandon's name was not only ripped off the magazine, was ripped off the dedication page of future editions of Atlas Shrugged, and where she wrote about, about the author at the end, uh, where she had written about the two most important men in her life, Frank O'Connor, her husband, and Nathaniel Brandon, and later editions, Nathaniel Brandon's name again was excised. When the reprints came out of Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and the Virtue of Selfishness, there began to appear little PS's. P.S. Nathaniel and Barbara Brandon are no longer associated with me, or with my philosophy, or with objectivism. <coughs> NBI is dissolved. Nathaniel Brandon Institute giving tape lectures to everyone across the country. Thousands of people is simply dissolved. Uh, there's an attempt to pick up the pieces, but nothing comes of it. This, in effect, leads to several other things. Uh, 1968, uh, Jarrett Wallstein and uh, John Knight Evers, Ever Everson, I believe his name was, 
began an organization called the Society for Rational Individualism. It was sort of a libertarian or politicized Randianism. Uh, they began a magazine called The Rational Individualist, which was attempting to pick up the audience. Wallstein managed to trick Brandon, who had moved to Los Angeles and started something called Academic Associates to uh, sell books and records through the mail. He tricked Brandon inadvertently into letting him rent the mailing list of Ad Academic Associates, which was really the 60,000 uh, mailing list of the old NBI. And Wolstein uh, hit it with a mailing and did very, very well, something like three or four percent. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of former devote followers of Ayn Rand became exposed to other ways of thinking, to the ideas of people like uh, Rothbard, Wolstein, myself, J uh, Morrison, Linda Tannehill, a whole group of other people. Reason Magazine has begun during the same year. Uh, it's a little throwaway produced off the, uh, uh, the, the MIT or Harvard campuses, a little mimeograph publication. 1969, you have a split between libertarians and young Americans for freedom and the conservatives. It's a bitter split. The libertarians leave, they join with the Society for a Rational Individualism and found really the first organization. They join with the Society for a Rational Individualism and found really the first organization of the modern libertarian movement, and that's the Society for Individual Liberty. It changes the name of the rational individualist and becomes the individualist. Uh, many other things happened the same year. Uh, the Libertarian Forum began to be published, Murray Rothbard's newsletter, which for the first five or six years of ex is its existence, at least the first four anyway, was probably the best publication of its, of, its, of its time and of its kind for giving a libertarian perspective on current issues. Uh, later, unfortunately, I would have to say that the uh, Libertarian Forum degenerated into intra-movement infighting and lost that sort of perspective on the world that Rothbard brought to it uh, in his late 40s and early 50s. Um, another important thing happened in 1969 in the March issue of Playboy. Carl Hess, former Goldwater speechwriter, author of those words, extremism in the, in the defense of liberty is no vice, moderation in the pur pursuit of virtue uh, moderation in the pursuit of justice, I believe, is no virtue. Um, there were several glowing words in the 1964 Goldwater acceptance speech publishes an article called The Death of Politics, uh, a very important, significant thing. They had an inpouring of mail like they had never had before. The Hess article in many ways remains the most eloquent, simple statement of libertarianism. Uh, it was a powerful influence in its day. From there on, we have the modern libertarian movement taking shape. We have one institution after another begin to be piled on the shoulders of these intellectual giants, of the Mises and the Hayeks and the Friedmans, of the Rosewater Lanes and the Isabel Pattersons and the Ayn Rands. Rand, of course, would never have anything to do with the libertarian movement. She would barely have anything to do with her family. Uh, she would barely have anything to do with her inner circle. Um, she was the sort of person for whom getting along with other people was not a high value, to put it mildly. Uh, so she continually, of course, denounced throughout this whole period any libertarian institution, the libertarian movement per se, because of its mixture of people who come from diverse intellectual backgrounds, because some people are mystics, that is to say Christians, other people are, are hippies of the right, which is to say anarcho-capitalists or something of that sort. Um, but in 1971, the Libertarian Party was launched. In 1972, it had its first national convention. Uh, or some of the leading figures in the libertarian movement over the next several years were to come together and begin to try to build a political party and movement. Um, several other things happened during the 1970s. Books and institutions began to spring up like little flowers all over the place. Um, Hayek, having decided that he's tried old age and didn't like it, decides to come back. <laughs> uh, publishes a slew of books, a slew of books, studies and new studies in politics, economics, history, uh, collections of essays, uh, his trilogy, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, begins in the early 70s. Uh, in the early 70s, von Mises is unfortunately dead. Um, he beat the age of 90, but he died nonetheless. Austrian centers began at uh, New York University, and later at Rutgers, and then George Mason University. Um, for New Liberty, Murray Rothbard's Libertarian Manifesto was published to some critical notice, but was largely ignored except by a few thousand libertarians and people who had been associated with Rand who snapped it up and took it seriously. In 1974, of course, one of the great books of um, the modern libertarian movement is published, one of the great intellectual works. Uh, 
that we've found so valuable in making ourselves credible before universities, indeed before the whole world. That's Anarchy, State, and Utopia by Robert Nozick of Harvard, which won the National Book Award in 1974. The Ayn Rand letter was started. Uh, Friedrich Hayek and later Milton Friedman win Nobel Prizes, and then George Stigler. Um, Bob Kephart, publisher of Human Events, reverses the cycle that had begun um, about 10 years earlier when Human Events went from an isolationist, anti-war, old right critic of warfare, welfare, state liberalism. Uh, Kephart had been one of the new conservatives in the 1960s who built Human Events. He gets in touch with people like Carl Hess, has an exchange of ideas with several younger libertarians, and defected from the conservative movement. It's he who conceived of a magazine called Libertarian Review. Uh, he found the early mailings for it were disappointing, and so he started instead Books for Libertarians, uh, which sold books to uh, thousands of people on a mailing list that he kept updated. It sold 10 or 12 new books and short reviews uh, over a period of about four years. And a lot of libertarians began to pick up quite a bit of knowledge of the literature and of their own history during this period. Um, lots of other things happened. Uh, 19, uh, the end of 1976, Kephart decides to sell what has become a tabloid, the Libertarian Review, uh, to certain individuals who named me as editor. Uh, I edited the magazine for five years until its demise. We saw the growth of Regas Magazine from a tiny magazine in the early 1970s to a, a slick circulation uh, magazine circulation in the early uh, 30,000s. We see the beginning of the Cato Institute of uh, Inquiry Magazine the beginnings of a young students' organization, Students for Libertarian Society, which was to prove uh, somewhat premature and abortive for reasons that we can talk about later. It's just an inherent collision uh, between uh, mature advisors and immature, uh, necessarily immature and hepped up and eager students. Um, so we take us, this takes us pretty much into today and uh, to uh, where we are at. Uh, a number of important things have happened in the libertarian movement in the last five years. And what it really is is a coalescing of these things set in motion, really beginning in the 20s and 30s and 40s by our forefathers, so to speak, and foremothers, uh, by men and women who held aloft a certain vision of individual liberty and who pursued it and pushed it with great tenacity, with great diligence, patience, and above all, sheer raw talent and hard work. Uh, when in the early 1970s, organizations began to spring up, uh, we saw the birth of things like the Reason Foundation, which attempted to take strides in the area of public policy. We saw the attempt of the Libertarian Party to break through in various levels of elections, uh, make a waves in California and Alaska and a few other states. Uh, we saw the Cato Institute begin under the leadership of Ed Crane in 1977 and begin to publish, publish Inquiry Magazine which later split off on its own under the aegis of the Libertarian Review Foundation. In uh, <clears throat> 1981, Cato moved to Washington, D.C., where it really began to get on uh, a very firm policy track, uh, which is to say it has begun to take up current issues like Social Security, the water crisis, uh, the gold standard, and several other things, and began really to take these before the influential policy-making community of Washington uh, overall as a whole. Uh, other organizations have been started, such as the National Taxpayers Legal Fund uh, in the late 1970s and uh, er early uh, 1980s. We have things like the creation of the Council for Competitive Economy under the leadership of David Bowes, uh, National Taxpayers Legal Fund, the National Taxpayers Union, a whole group of libertarian founded or spearheaded organizations designed to take on either single issues or single constituencies. Inquiry, a magazine trying to address the intelligent uh, lay public, the, in, the intellectual community concerned with public policy issues. Um, libertarian Review attempted to do something similar within the libertarian movement until it was um, folded in 1981. Uh, and elements of it adopted in a new format of Inquiry magazine. And Cato itself began to run very important conferences on things like in search of stable money and social security. Uh, protectionism, free trade, industrial policy, things that we have coming up. I mention these things to you because the libertarian movement as it's developed, has become a very complicated and very interesting engine for possible political, intellectual, and social change. Uh, there's a great diversity in these organizations and a lot of vitality and energy. 
uh, some of it unfortunately not yet, yet unleashed in uh, fashions uh, destined to make an impact. But where we are at right now in the libertarian movement is that we are at a new stage of maturity. We're at a stage of much greater proficiency than any movement uh, similar to what we are in spirit and in intention for really the last 130 or 40 years. Uh, really at no time since the repeal of the Corn Laws in England has any movement had anything like the potential for impact that libertarianism does today and the libertarian movement does today. Um, as for where we are going and what we can achieve, I will leave that for my topic of my talk tomorrow night at the banquet. But what I've attempted to do here is give you a very brief overview of some of the exciting things which have happened over the last 40 years, 50 years, the last half century, from the death of classical liberalism to the rebirth of a libertarian movement. We are on a higher intellectual level than classical liberalism was. We have scholars who are more numerous. We have young people coming up in abundance. In abundance. We have more raw talent. We have more institutions which seem to be functioning along the paths that they should than any other time, really, since the middle 19th century. Uh, the prospects for liberty is something I will get into tomorrow night, but I will say right now, in closing this up, that what we have gone through in the last 30 and 40 and 50 years has been traumatic in this country. What we've gone through in the death of the classical liberal movement and its rebirth in the libertarian movement of today is nothing more nor less than a transformation which does have the potential in the decades and years to come to change the face of not only the history of America, but of much of the world as well. Thank you. I've run over as I promised. Uh, we can take questions now if you'd like, or we can take them over uh, over there, which uh, is more appropriate. Okay.